In 1998, the South Bank Show interviewed Wayne Sleep, a dancer of record-breaking speed and agility, which he applied brilliantly to both the classical ballet and the commercial theatre world. Wayne Sleep was born in Plymouth in 1948. His mother, an aspiring singer, had had an affair with a married band leader. Sleep never met his father and was raised by his mother's extended family. They later moved to Hartlepool. He went to dance school once a week from the age of five. So what happened at this dancing school? Did you learn a lot or was it uh, just tokenism really? Oh no, no. Um, it was theatre for me. And it was colour, it was lights, it was, yes, showing off. Five foot two, eyes of blue, but oh, what those five foot could do. Has anybody seen my girl? Turned up nose, turned down holes. My first competition was when I was eight. And I went to the Middlesbrough tournaments and I sang Five Foot Two, Eyes of Blue and won the cup for the under 12s. The adjudicator was sitting there when she judged me, and I, I danced with my feet turned out like Charlie Chaplin, because that's the perfect stance for, for a classical ballet dancer. She said, this boy must learn ballet, and I looked at my mother and she shriveled. Where is that boy's mother? And she shriveled in her seat like this, going, no, I'm not here. Because, <laughs> I mean, ballet to them meant all the all the things they do to sort of male chauvinism. Given that you were the only boy dancing at your school, as I understand, what sort of reaction did you get from the other lads? They were, they were horrible, the kids. They were rude. But when I got to the tech, the West Hartlepool tech, um, I became sort of a school mascot because I did a hornpipe on stage and it got an ovation. I had to repeat it. Never been so successful. <laughs> In 1961, at the age of 12, Wayne Sleep auditioned for a place at White Lodge in Richmond Park, the Royal Ballet's junior school for the nation's most promising dancers. Out of 400 kids, I was awarded the scholarship along with another girl. That was it. Changed my life totally. So what did you think about this place when you came to it? Well, I'm, I felt like I was going into a palace. I mean, you know, from an outside low in Hartlepool. You know, with a little house and it was very industrial. Coming here was incredible. Were you intimidated when you came? Did you wonder whether you could live up to it and that sort of thing? Out of 30 girls that were in my class, only two of them became classical ballet dancers. That's how hard it is. Had they taken a test on your height and realized that you weren't going to grow to be a tall chap, you wouldn't have been accepted? Look at those thin wrists. That's how they do it. They x-ray your wrist. And they can tell whether you're going to grow within about six inches of, you know, five foot two to five foot six, they said. <laughs> Remained at five two and forever shrinking. And um, I was lucky that we had to catch the train back to Hartlepool because I couldn't go for the height test at Great Ormond Street. And had they known that, they probably wouldn't have awarded me the scholarship because they need useful people like tall boys to partner girls. And I would not have filled the bill. Was there any one time when that hit you first on the nose, Wayne, when you really... Yes, that's really my first link with Nanette de Varwa. She said, if you are going to get a place in this company, you have to spin faster and with twice as many turns and jumped higher than all the rest because she realized and she was giving me a piece of information that I was of no use to the company whatsoever in the corps de ballet. Dame Ninette de Valois, founder of the Royal Ballet, has championed Wayne Sleep throughout his career as a dancer. Earlier this year, she celebrated her 100th birthday. She coached me 
and for her to take that trouble meant so much to me. There was a bond. There's always been a bond. Also, she likes naughty boys. <laughs> You're half my age. I know. <laughs> I'm 50, darling. What's the, what are the rest of the 50 years like? <laughs> For certain parts, his height was perfect. At 18, he was plucked from the Royal Ballet School by Sir Frederick Ashton, director of the Royal Ballet, to play Napoleon to Ashton's ugly sister in the company's version of Cinderella. He went on to star in several Ashton productions, most memorably as Puck in The Dream. I brought in elements that Ashton didn't mind at all. And the wonderful thing is the scherzo where Dal and I are just like dancing through and suddenly I would dash across the stage and the speed and the light was just, it just fitted my body totally. It comes from Hartley Pool, which might explain quite a lot. And his mother took him to the Royal Ballet School when he was a boy. Uh, and his energy, uh, she'd spotted the fact that he couldn't stop dancing when he was five or six or something like that. That seems to happen very, very often with dancers. Um, and they accepted him, he got the job, he didn't grow to more than five foot two. But a lot of choreographers were so entranced by his energy and uh, skill and determination that Frederick Ashton, Nuriev, Macmillan, they did ballets that they made sure that he was in them. No matter how brilliantly Sleep performed, his size prevented him from playing the princely roles, and he was often typecast as a child or an animal. Here, in Enigma Variations, as half man, half dog. And famously on film, a squirrel nutkin and one of two bad mice. being all dressed up in Beatrix Potter, how'd that strike you? Disgusting. <laughs> I danced it up a storm in the studios, and I couldn't give it full value once I put the costume on. I couldn't see a thing. They put a red light at the front by the camera, so I knew I was facing the front when I saw red. There comes a point after the 14th take, you think, why am I here? dancers are really deeply dedicated to dancing and think about it all the time but Wayne wanted to know about everything else that was going on in the world and so he was different and that's why I took to him immediately his mind was alive but he was unbelievably <laughs> um, yeah I met a few dancers but most are not like that I introduced him to George, who he lived with then for a number of years. And I remember David once had a check that was signed by George, and David drew a portrait of me on the back of the check. So George has now got a little masterpiece on the back of a 15 quid check for dinner. <laughs> That's what I like. <laughs> to see how closely involved he was with that circle of at that time, late 60s, early 70s, was, uh, was fascinating because, yeah, it was unusual. I think Hockney says that, you know, he wasn't like other dancers, and, and he certainly wasn't. Um, and for him to have found that crowd and to, to, to mix with them in the way he did was, was um, very typical of Wayne, and, and I think it probably opened his eyes to, to the arts in a different way. In 1970, Sir Frederick Ashton left the Royal Ballet and was replaced as artistic director by Kenneth Macmillan. 
Wayne Sleep, who'd fared well under Ashton's leadership, suddenly found himself marginalised. I thought, oh dear, here we go, Ashton's gone, and so am I. Though remaining a member of the company, Wayne began to seek out a new career in television, first as a dancer and then as a celebrity. The next day I walk in and everybody would be on the bar and nobody would acknowledge me. And I'd think, oh dear, because it wasn't real art. Wayne Sleep's ability and his popularity with audiences soon convinced Macmillan to create several roles specifically for him, including a duet in elite syncopations with Virgil Derman, the tallest ballerina in the company. Wainsley finally left the Royal Ballet in 1979 to form his own dance company, Dash. Dame Lynette de Valois fought hard to change his mind. She said, but we trained you, you owe it to us to stay. And I said, but I do one new role a year if I'm lucky, madam. You know, I've got to do something else. And she was so disappointed, but she went, you'll be all right in the commercial theater. I was um, poo-pooed a lot because uh, I was not doing the right thing. I'd sold myself out. Did you feel hurt by this criticism? Well, you're bound to everybody's hurt by criticism. Oh, I was hurt by it. It was all my own money. It was what I had, what I could do to entertain the public. It was not premeditated in any way to go commercial and make money out of my training at the Royal Ballet School or with the Royal Ballet. And I tried to do it with integrity believe it or not. The Royal Ballet is subsidized. There are many subsidized companies in this country that serve very well. But what about the jazz dancer, the tap dancer, the singing dancer? There's been nothing for them in this country. And he typified, it seemed to me, a openness by dance, a willingness to come to front stage and appeal to the people, and a constant cheerfulness, which is a, maybe an odd word. It seems if you're cheerful, you can't be serious. But he was serious. He was a very, very accomplished dancer. And Nina de Valois, who was one of the persons who trained him, wouldn't have put up with anything less. And she thought the world of him, both as a person, but as a very skillful dancer. Oh, well, in 1981, Wayne Sleep took a leading role in a new musical, Cats. Although it was an unexpected success for Andrew Lloyd Webber's team, Wayne fell out with the choreographer and left after only nine months. I was the first one to leave Cats, and I, and I left um, Song and Dance after six months. Were you sorry to leave? You left that again soon. I mean, do you think you're quite difficult to work with? Ha! <laughs> I'm like a piece of blotting paper to a man with a brain. <laughs> But elsewhere, I will not tolerate um, fools gladly. But then I'm an idiot myself. In 1998, I was asked to make a solo for Wayne um, for the programme, the South Bank Show programme. And uh, to, he was 50. I was to celebrate his 50th birthday. And it was the first time I'd worked with him as a choreographer. Um, and. I have to say, he was at, still at that age able to do everything. And so, I, and he asked me to really push him to, to move differently and to really challenge him. So I chose a piece of music that was uh, started quickly, had a very fast section at the beginning and then went into a very slow section. So there was a contrast in it because he's very famous for um, moving incredibly quickly and that's his thing, you know, he's, he's small stature and, and can move incredibly fast. And I could see that he was yearning to be given something to do that was not just zipping around like a firecracker. So I chose this piece of music, it was a piece of Benjamin Britten, to make this solo, to give him that contrast, to show what he was good at and famous for, but also to show another side of him.
This dance was choreographed not long after Lady Diana's death. Wayne Sleep and Diana had become friends ever since they danced together on stage at a charity benefit at Covent Garden. How did you come to dance a duet with um, the Princess of Wales? Well, it was her idea. Suddenly I get a phone call saying, um, would I do a dance with her on stage at Covent Garden? I went, excuse me. So I went to see her and she was in a leotard and tights and leg warmers in those days. And um, I said, well, what can we do together? You're so tall, I'm so small. She went, well, I don't know. And then she started to giggle and then I made a joke. And then I realized what a sense of humor she had. So I thought, ah, we can make this work. And did your friendship continue after that? Did you? Yes, it did, for several years. And the last letter I got from her was last July the 2nd, actually, last year. I hadn't seen her for a while before that, but we had um, a relationship which now I realise was actually much closer than a lot of people who knew her. Were you surprised at the reaction to her death? No, not at all. We're putting together the Wayne Seat Dance Scholarship in Princess Diana's memory. I go all over Britain with workshops and I find that a lot of very talented young dancers find it unable to continue their training in their dance vocation because all the grants are being taken from the local councils. So we're all here to do something about it and thank you for your support tonight. Thank you. Here we go. Are you ready? <coughs> I teach them how to perform on stage, give them a routine they've never done before, and then they can go away and practice it. Now, nice walk down the stairs. That's it. Nice sways. That's nice body movement. Good. Now, a nice curtsy. Turn out those legs. Good. Look up again. Nothing. Again. Never mind. Into the centre. OK, don't worry about it. Enjoy it. More joy in the faces. That's better. Go on, double take. Every career has its ups and downs. And in the late 80s, you, your career had a bit of a down. What was going on there? I'd sort of done everything, and I was getting older. I mean, even Diana said, when are you going to retire? I said, when I paid the mortgage, dear, you know? And um, I just felt that there was no future, really. And I was very lonely. I um, had nobody to live with. And um, I used to doss down on people's couches, friends' couches, you know, just stay the night wrong and go home. Drank a lot. But you're still dancing at 50. Is it hard work? Hard, much harder work now? I'm a performer. I just can't help myself. Is that what drives you, you think, being a performer? No, what drives me is the audience. And when I go out there and hear the reaction of the audience, I think, what a buzz. It's the highest high you'd ever get. In fact, Princess wrote to me the night of uh, when we danced together. And I just found the letter, actually, just a couple of weeks ago. And she said, now I know the buzz you get from performing in front of an audience. So it's spring and hot, 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 hot, spring and hot, spring and hot, spring. One. Touch step or change. Heel. And the other way. Turn the wheel. Step, salute. Salute. Pull the rope. Front roll. Swing toe hops. Slides back. 
Yes, absolute slope. Heel toe. Shuffle. Toe. To the back. Corner. Turn. Slide. Salute. Do you think you'd have enjoyed the same success as a dancer if you'd started today? Whew. Yes, with the right teaching. Mm. But far too small to join the Royal Ballet. Even the girls now have to be a certain height. And then they put on their point shoes and they're six inches taller. So, I mean, they're, I think the minimum height is taller than me. Mm. And you still think that's unjust? Totally. If you're the best, you should win the race. <laughs>